par une spiritualité reliée au vivant. Welcome everyone to the Eco Spirituality Summit. And so today I have the joy and pleasure to welcome Keda Brown, which is someone who is really dear to my heart and plays a, a big role in my own eco spiritual journey. And so before we dive into the interview, uh, I know you want to open the space with an invocation, Keda. So I hand it over to you. Thank you, Vanessa. It's, it's a great honor to be here and a privilege to, to be sitting with you across the pond in this way. And uh, so, yes, yeah, so I'd like to begin with an invocation, since that's the, the essence of uh, where eco and spirituality come together, is in the conversation between the worlds. So, in my rattle, I can adjust my screen a little bit. I'd like to begin in that way. So I'd like you to invite you to see yourself standing in a place in nature, a place that, uh, what I like to say, a place that knows your name, a place that you have become authentically familiar to and that you know. And imagine standing there as the sun is rising. So with much gratitude, with open hearts, with clear hearts, and with humble hearts, we acknowledge the First Nation peoples of this land on which I sit right now, the Cherokee. We thank you for leaving all of the medicine in the ground that you have left here so that we could dig it up and remember our name and remember how to be in right relationship with creation. With much gratitude for your lives and your medicine. I hope. And we're turning toward the east, toward that sunrise, toward springtime, that place of new beginnings and fresh new starts, that place where we see for the first time every time, the place where we've dropped the old stories that we know ourselves by or that we know others by, and we look with new eyes of wonder and curiosity and inspiration as we begin around the wheel again. So to those good medicine people of the East, we call upon you in this moment to enter this global conversation, this global discussion, to move through us and offer that good medicine of the East that would be assisting us in this conversation this day. With much gratitude, we welcome you. Uh -huh. Now quarter turn to the right, you face south toward the warm summer winds, toward summer the deep green vegetation of summer. The place where we bring our visions into form, the place of manifesting our dreams. The place of coyote, rattlesnake, the place of action, beauty and love unshadowed by thought. The place of courage and impeccability and playfulness and passion. We call upon the good medicine people of the South to awaken within each one of us that bone memory where you live as well. With much gratitude, we welcome you. I hope. Quarter turn to the West, to the wheel we face West, to the place of the setting sun, autumn leaves bright colored on the ground and overhead, the place of the harvest, a place where we turn toward the healing waters of reconciliation and support, a place where the sap starts to recede on the vine and we begin to turn inwards, the place of bear and owl. We call upon the good medicine people of the West to awaken within each one of us that bone memory where you live as well. With much gratitude, we welcome you. I hope. Once again, a quarter turn to the right, we face north. We face toward the, the winter, toward the sacred mountain, toward the place of deep release and surrender and letting go and self-acceptance. 
to the place of surrendering so deeply that spring simply is nudged into being because we let go enough. We call on prayerfulness and storytelling and all the good medicine people of the North to awaken within each one of us that bone memory where you live as well. We welcome you. I hope. And turning our gaze skyward, imagining a night sky full of stars, full of moon, sun having just set, we turn our attention skyward. We call upon the great sky nation. We acknowledge you, Grandmother Moon, for teaching us how to own those shadowy things within ourselves and bring them into the light over and over and over again. Grandfather Son, we thank you for teaching us how to show up every day to be real, to be authentic, to speak truth. How to fall down seven times and get up eight, always eight. To our star sisters and brothers and others, we acknowledge you and we thank you for shining your light down upon us and reminding us too how to shine as a beacon of light by the way we live our lives. With much gratitude, we welcome you to this conversation to awaken that stardust within each of us, that bone memory where you live as well. I hope. And then we put our hands on the earth, maybe put our bellies to the ground, the place where soil and soul and body are woven together like a braid of sweet grass. There are three separate bra braids between the soil, our physical body, our spiritual body, woven together in that one instance of putting hands on the soil, on the earth. And we thank you, Mother Earth. We thank you, Gaia, Pachamama, Earth Spirit, for teaching us of belonging, of home, of connection, of place, for reminding us that scarcity is an illusion that's only brought about when we live out of balance with you. So we thank you for those sometimes difficult teachings that remind us to live in balance. With much gratitude, we welcome all the good medicine from the great below. Uh -huh. Now we turn our attention to our ancestors, to those seven generations and beyond that have come before us, the seven generations and beyond that are coming after us. We thank you for your footprints and your heartbeats, for your tears and your laughter, all left in the ground, in the soil. We thank you for dreaming us into this place. And may the way in which we live our lives be an acknowledgement of gratitude for the lives that have passed before us, an acknowledgement of welcome for the lives that are coming. With much gratitude, we welcome you to the conversation. Uh -huh. And to the spirits of the land around me here in the highlands of the Blue Ridge Mountains in North Carolina, to the spirits of the lands in which you live, the standing tall people, the stone people, the flowing rivers, wide, expansive oceans, to plant medicine people, to the four-legged and two-legged and winged ones of these lands and your lands, we acknowledge you and we thank you for the reminders that we are not separate, that if we simply took the time to connect more deeply and enter the conversation, we would find that, that sacred crossroads of the soil and soul. With much gratitude, we welcome you to the conversation, I hope, and to the great council that sits on the other side of the fire, stirring the coals and keeping them hot. We thank you for the way you tend the fires on that side, and we thank you for standing by us and believing in us. Even when we stumble and fall and sometimes have a hard time believing in ourselves or each other, we thank you for keeping the fire burning. And may the way in which we tend the fires on this side be a blessing to all our relations, human and non-human, living and non-living, with much gratitude. Ashe.
take a deep breath and bring yourself back to your, or maybe only halfway back to your computer. Keep, keep one foot in that other place so we can do what information it might share with us. <laughs> yes, it's, I love your invocations because they are such a journey. Like it's, every time I do it, I just feel like, okay, I, I, I took out all my antennas again and my roots and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm back to, yeah, to, to, to my center. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, uh, it leaves me feeling every time I speak in invocation, like I've placed one foot back in that other consciousness and connection. And now I have one foot here. So it's a little bit altering. <laughs> um, but that's the, yeah, that's the place where the inspiration comes through. You know, I always, uh, one of my prayers is always uh, that spirit make me adequate to say something useful <laughs> in these conversations. <laughs> That's a good prayer. Make me adequate. <laughs> mm, thank you so much. And it's, yeah, it's such a gift for the summit to have this invocation. And, and I hope it's going to support us all to root uh, in this exploration, which is like lasting a, a whole week and yeah. very rich. And, and thank you so much for joining, uh, joining the, the voices, the different voices of the Eco Spirituality Summit. Yeah, exciting to be here. Mm. So I would like to invite you to introduce uh, yourself. Um, shall I say a few words first, or do you feel like you know what? You... A few words, and then yeah. I'll, I'll add some something. <laughs> so I have actually I met you in a summit uh, many years ago, like mm -hmm. six or seven years ago, and it was just Justin, so my my first business mentor and, and summit mentor. Mm -hmm. And I really rem I really remember I was fascinated. Like there was something about you. I was like who who is he and and the way you spoke and the way you share and also something i i really love about the way you share is poetry so maybe i would ask you to read a poem for us at some point okay. <laughs> just planting the seed now <laughs> and um so i've been following you for a while and, and drinking in a lot of what you were saying and so last year i was so blessed to be able to, to do a vision quest uh, with you so that's one of the things you offer. That's one of the, the, the transmissions you carry, like facilitating vision quests. And um, yeah, so do you want to add something? Um, I would say I'm a wanderer looking for home. Mm. And um, in helping create uh, healing and belonging in those places of home. Uh, that I find myself uh, around the planet with different people. Um, a place where um, what we call community um, is a uh, relationship to not only uh, other humans, but to the natural world and to the sacred. So I say that, that like that sweet, sweet grass that's woven in three braids, I think of those, those three braids. Um, the connection between ecology, spirituality, and, and uh, as, as humans. Um, and um, other than that, on a more uh, practical note, um, I consider myself a, a Rites of Passage guide with um, founding Rites of Passage Council, um, a, a ceremonialist that loves being in the sacred waters of uh, in conversation of ritual um, and, uh, and a diviner offering uh, divination, uh, what's called cowrie shell divination for, for individuals. Um, this is my three, my three main loves of the work that I offer. And, uh, and then following the threads wherever it happens to take me, like over there to meet you over in Spain and doing that wonderful vision quest over there. Um, so that's just a little bit, a little bit about, about me. <laughs> yeah, and we will get to know you more during the conversation. But I also would like, because I love stories, 
-hmm. and I love I love like life stories mm -hmm. and I love when people just share some stories of their life so is there any story from your life that you would feel called to share in the in the in the lens of eco spirituality and of like this summit also maybe um relating with the with the topic uh, we chose for the interview which is questions at the crossroads of soil and soul which is such a great title and such a like i'm <laughs> I'm sure like it's it's so rich, like the soil, really rich. So is there any story from your life um, that you would like to share? Let me, um, stories have a way of kind of finding me instead of me hunting for them. Um, so what's what uh, seems to want to be said now is just kind of this, this title, which I literally came up with this morning before the interview, I sat down and, um, I had gone for a walk um, this morning uh, and I went for a walk out on the land and we we're walking along this creek and um, and we found a, a blue jay that had um, fallen prey I'm imagining to Al during the night because it wasn't there but the, yesterday when we were down there in that area of the creek and so we entered into a conversation blue jay what is Blue Jay here to teach us and tell us in this moment? Um, I have this uh, saying that I call picking up feathers. It, it references this idea when people love to like go around the line and picking up feathers. And what I call picking up feathers is that when you pick up a feather, it means you're picking up the responsibility to carry the medicine of the one that you have just picked up. It's not for ornate purposes. Um, so looking at this Blue Jay, <laughs> and thinking about okay now if I pick up this this bird and and turn parts of this bird into ceremonial pieces um, what is the medicine that I have agreed to take on so I entered into that conversation with my with my sweetie Lynn and we just we talked about blue jay its fierceness it's uh, on what I call on the medicine wheel it's one of those energies of the of the of the South, um, a place of uh, right action, right time, boldness. Um, so I began to look at the, the the life and the behavior of Blue Jay and what it's what it's teaching me. What does it mean to pick this up and work with this medicine this morning? Um, so it, for me, this this place of soil and soul, this this forgotten landscape of understanding, is really about living in a uh, an animate or animus realm of understanding where everything's alive everything uh, has something to uh, that it may need or something that it may offer let's say it has medicine there's an exchange that happens um, I'm remember now I'm, now a story comes in of a of a very animate eco uh, psychology or eco spiritual moment so we're we're in uh we're in the vision quest ceremony not the one you were at but a different one and we're doing this thing called death lodge process which is the the term is a reference as you know to preparation for the the actual threshold period um, where one goes to reconcile that which is unreconciled before going up on the mountain so I'm in this uh, ritual process work with this this uh, woman who is reconciling a childhood of great difficulty. And we're uh, sitting in the lodge and this bird comes flying through, it's an open air lodge and comes flying through, uh, I notice out of the north and grazes the top of her head and then lands on a, a rafter just uh, in the south of the lodge. And sits there for a moment and the lady just kind of does like this and, and we both turn our attention to the bird and now was landed on the rafter and then it ducks out and heads to the south so my uh, uh, my awareness is going okay this this one I wasn't sure which bird it was but it did come in north from north to south um, and so I took note of that we can say from winter into summer or from it, it went into the place of, of on the medicine wheel, we'd say 
the place of childhood um, and disappeared. And then we turned back toward the work and as the, work, the, the ritual process unfolded, the, the woman was able to do a lot of healing release work about, again, some great difficulties in her childhood. And as a part of that work, she had uh, asked that somebody enroll as her child self and placed her about 40 yards out into the woods behind this tree. And, um, and so as the work came to a conclusion, now we're standing out underneath this tree um, and she's reconnecting with this, this lost part of herself that she separated from when she was little. And as she embraces this child self, um, I noticed that same bird sitting on a limb, not eight feet off the ground, so maybe three feet above our heads, is that bird sitting on the edge of a nest, feeding its babies. Mm. Now, we can't choreograph something like that. <laughs> and yet the, the message uh, that, that came through was very clear, this, this tending of the young, this tending of the babies. The story continuing to unfold is that when this woman went out on the land to, to set her purpose circle, her stone circle to quest in, she had chosen a spot on the land, uh, unbeknownst to her, that was the territory of a large male deer, a buck. And interestingly enough, a lot of this woman's work in the ritual process was about setting clear boundaries with the, with the, the, the overly aggressive masculine. And so here she is now on her solo time in her stone circle and into the space as, as evening is coming on comes this large male deer. And it starts snorting and pawing the ground, trying to intimidate, get her to move out of its place. Apparently it sleeps there. And she made a decision in that moment, said, I'm not leaving. You have to leave. And so they had this, this little dance of, of uh, boundaries. And then the deer left. The buck walked away. And so it's a story that I have noticed that uh, in ritual, there's this conversation between the, uh, the ecological and natural surroundings, ourselves and the sacred, um, that, that begins to unfold in, in, not in way more than a coincidental way. We can say this isn't coincidence. Um, and what I've noticed that in ritual, what I've come to believe is that the natural world recognizes us as one of their own and tends to come in close. So I've countless stories about numerous animals and, and, and things that just come in, all of a sudden they show up in a ritual. They're just there. Um, we just finished a vision quest recently and, and the questers group was called the, the Turtle Clan. And we had turtles showing up every day. Matter of fact, one day we were sitting in the lodge and turtle comes walking down the hill, enters the lodge, and at the same time, like a five foot black snake enters the lodge and they just kind of cruise right across the lodge together and we're just, they're just part of the conversation. Um, so anyway, there's, there's this way in which um, when, we, when we enter into a ritual conversation, an invocation uh, of uh, supportive, we could say, spirit allies of, of all the different faiths and traditions that we may draw upon and whatever names we give them, that when we, when we call on that uh, energy to be part of the conversation, um, it shows up and it shows up in the natural world. So this kind of this eco-spirituality is really um, a way of activating the conversation of what's already there, like bringing these two things together. And, um, and also think now of um, many, many, many indigenous cultures, uh, their own cosmology systems, uh, or what we call medicine wheels of, of understanding these circular, seasonal, directional blueprints 
of, of uh, how we understand our relationship, not just to ourselves and each other as humans, but also to creation. Um, and so like an invocation, you know, turning toward the east. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm gonna, because I know our listeners may be all over the planet, I'm not sure where they are. So um, the medicine wheel that I reference is more consistent with where I live. Um, because these, this is my relationship to this area. So I would say this particular uh, longitudinal axis of the planet, which would be different, you know, if we were down, down under in Australia. So I just want to acknowledge that, that these cosmologies would be anchored in one's relationship to the, the creatures and the land on which they lived. And um, so another one is uh, uh, braided sweetgrass references where I say that your individual identity and your ancestral identity and your connection to the lands of your ancestors at one time were woven so tight mm -hmm. that they were inseparable. You couldn't speak about one without really speaking about all three. And so in those times and in those places of our ancient ancestors, um, the orientation to a cosmology of understanding that began with, say, in even where does the sun rise? And what are the seasons? And what are the directions? And what are the animals and the, and the uh, traits of these different places on the planet um, that we see even referenced in the many stone circles throughout Europe and in and, and Great Britain and uh, Northern Europe where they, they have created these ways of, of circular reference to the cosmos, um, not just on nature but also astrologically. Um, so I think it, it, it's in us, this, this um, what I call the bone memory of, of recognition, of connection, um, that has been, we've been, uh, you know, through, through trauma after trauma after trauma that, that humans have uh, bestowed on one another, um, we've created this, uh, what's often called in this field, the great lie, which is that we're separate. Um, and that nature and, and eco and, and all that is devoid of, of spirituality or, or devoid of the sacred. Um, it's as if we have not evolved beyond Newtonian physics. <laughs> and, um, and yet the, the world of spirituality and, and science are, are confirming each other over and over. Um, and as my, um, my ancestors would say from some from Ireland or Scotland is like the the other world is not an etheric someplace up there it is simply right outside your door mm -hmm. it is in the trees it is in the the stones it is in the rivers it, it is in the it is in the land um, and often referenced as a song that comes from these places that you can listen and and, and uh, begin to connect with um, so the, uh, the, the, when people talk about the two worlds and I say, oh, it's, it's way too much work to reference it as two worlds. You have to keep going back and forth. <laughs> it's like, well, it's just, it's just one world and it's all here. It's not separate. And then it's just how you shift your attention, uh, that can open up that perception, um, or, or close it off. And so it's, um. And I look at the fascination people have this these days with uh, plant medicine, and uh, it, it's uh, it, it's a powerful ally that assists people in activating and, and resourcing that deep awareness. Um, sadly, it's also uh, um, it kind of speaks to a culture that is uh, addicted to immediate gratification without the hard work and um and so it's you know it's a, it's a dance i think you know we're, we're we're trying to 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 shift our consciousness and not just in that way but in many ways um but yeah the stories are just so many of this 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 dance between um the natural world and spirit and our consciousness 
um, that it really is simply attuning um, mm. to the presence of it. And then you just, I mean, start to see it all the time. It's, and, the, and the idea is if you look at your surroundings from an animate perspective, animus meaning it's all alive, it's all in conversation with us, we just need to get, get into the conversation. Um, then you start to uh, read your surroundings with, the, with what I call the eyes of a diviner, where everything has multiple levels of, of information and communication um, and, and being able to access that, let's say to enter the conversation um, and see where that moves us, you know, this these times that we live in definitely call for a, a deeper union and conversation, not just with the sacred, but with the presence of the sacred uh, in you know our, in our natural world. Um, and you know, for us to be willing to show up to the conversation um, and listen. Actually, it's more about listening than, than talking. <laughs> and so I wonder, what does it take to, oh, yeah, I don't know. It's a bit of a general question, but what does it take for us to, to become uh, capable of listening? Having and, a conversation, yeah, yeah. <laughs> of, of beginning with listening. I think it, it begins with being able to quiet our minds. Um, and so that we can hear something beyond their own discourse in our heads about what's happened or what might happen. Um, because when our minds become quiet, um, the ruminations are replaced with awareness of the moment. You know, it's in those places of, of quiet, um, you know, where we notice turtle all of a sudden coming down the hill or snake going here or a bird that uh, lands on the windshield wiper of a car. And it's like, hmm, why is that? I mean, that's never happened before. Like seeing it happen yesterday, sitting in the corner of this bird land right on the, on the windshield looking in the window. I guess. Um, so this, uh, although that wouldn't take much quieting of the mind when certain things happen. They can snap you out of your ruminations. We are coming to. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> they can sometimes help when they when they show up in really poignant ways to make you pay attention. Um, but I think being able to have some method of uh, quieting the, the, the ruminations of our mind um, so that we can open our awareness to what's in front of us. Mm. And there are many methods. There's meditation, there's prayer, there's um, simply just shift your your attention to pay and to pay attention to what's you know what's really in front of you in the moment, um, and just start listening. You know, listen. Use your five senses to to first tune in that way. Um, and then I like I like to add when you're listening and you notice things. Um, we, because we have a, 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 a culture or a society, I don't know if we have a culture anymore, sadly. We have a modern society um, that um, that's kind of so separate from the, that conversation. The way I say, the way I like to begin, if you want to begin a conversation with the sacred in, in nature, is first quiet your mind, sit there long enough to where you notice something, um, something of a of a, something that catches your attention. Um, and rather than asking the question, "What does this mean?" Um, because we tend to treat meaning as a, a a fixed construct that once we have it, we can put it on a shelf um, and then apply. Um, our, the rest of our perspective to that. Um, and I said, no, meaning's more like a river. It's very fluid. Um, if you're going to fix it, just know that it may be different tomorrow or next week. Um, so 
rather than asking, what does this mean? Um, be willing to go live a little more dangerously, uh, which is ask the question, in light of this experience, what action am I guided to take? Um, and this is what I call activating the conversation with the sacred. And I don't mean with your life. I mean today, maybe this week, but not much further than that. Um, and also say as, uh, as long as it fits within your, your integrity to do so, then do it. You know, trust your own guidance with, with the guide, with the guidance. Um, and once, you, and then keep it close in, in time and space. That's what I say. Not, not what am I, action am I to do with my life, but like here and now, this moment. Um, and the closer you bring it to you in time and space, be prepared that the least likely it will make sense. So you bring it in close and it says, well, I just want you to walk up that hill and sit at the base of that big oak tree and watch the setting sun. Okay, not sure why I'm going to do that, but I'm going to go do that. And then you watch what happens next, because now you've entered the conversation. Um, so it's it's what one of my teachers, Rocking Bear, when he'd say, you want to live your life as a ceremony. And there's a, a certain uh, quality of attention you give to things when you're in that space. Um, Somebody asked me one time when they were talking about, you know, should they do this quest and why would this information be any better, any different, any wiser than all the things they've studied? Um, I said, probably it won't. If you've done a lot of studying, it might not be any different than anything you've ever studied. Um, but what it can offer you is a, a quality of how you pay attention. Not new information, but a way of relatedness, a, a way of um, a quality of awareness and relationship. So it's not about information, it's really more about relationship to uh, an animate conversation. Um, and then allowing oneself to be inspired, to be moved, to, to be directed um, by that. Mm. Um, and, and sometimes you find uh, you know, the title that I came up with this uh, was partly inspired um, by Joanna Macy, or even before her, Carl Gustav Jung. Um, I think it, uh, maybe originally uh, Carl Jung, uh, and then later re-emphasized by Joanna Macy when, when she said, there's a question that runs like a thread through everyone's life. And if you find it, it will direct your life. And, and uh, questions, and th those kind of questions aren't simply to be how quickly can we answer it. Those kind of questions are what guide a life that you live into. Um, so you want to have a question that you have a lot of space to, to explore, to live into, that, that pulls you forward in your life, to, to answer by how you live your life. Um, and so that's when I thought about, you know, this, this place of, of soil and soul, or what we call an eco-spirituality, um, you know, that crossroads hopefully is, is a place where you find that kind of question that you live into. Um, it's like, uh, uh, speaking of poems, there's a poem I wrote called Follow Your Name, which speaks of that, that concept that um, a name or a, what we call a medicine name or something that one is often uh, given or, or comes to them uh, following these great journeys of, of initiation or, or are not meant to be a description of somebody or describe the qualities that we see in them. It's meant to be a roadmap of where you're headed. Um, and I always say a good medicine name is not one that will feel comfortable because you haven't lived into it. Um, and so it may be hard to utter or even to speak out loud. Maybe you don't speak it out loud because the sense of it carries a great responsibility, a great question to live into. Um, so those are, 
you know, that, that place, that crossroads. It's like, what is the, how do I get to that crossroads? You know, by, by quieting my mind and beginning to pay attention. Mm. Um, and then what, do, what arises? Um, and I will say often what arises first is all the unhealed ways in which you've become separate. Um, some of them ancestral, not personal to your own life biography. Um, but yet living through you and wanting to heal through you. Um, and so these things arise first that need uh, attention and healing. Um, and that's hard. That's hard, hard work sometimes. Um, but but uh, to turn grief into praise. No, no less amount of tears, but it just it, it's that place where grief becomes praise tears begin to shift towards something like that healing uh, that happens as we uh, allow that stuff to rise up. Um, and then what I've noticed happened, and it certainly happened in my life and it seems to happen for others, is that healing takes place. There is an expanded relational consciousness that begins to go out beyond, certainly beyond ruminations and beyond humans, like to to realize the relationship to what's around them in the natural world and, and how intricately we are connected uh, to say like the honeybee mm. that uh, you know we, we couldn't live without um, so these things start we start to realize that we're all deeply connected and and, uh, and everything influences everything um, as they say you're you're, be mindful of your thoughts because those are your prayers. Um, and so you want to be intentional with your dreaming. Um, mm. And, and dream, dream yourself down the road into, into uh, something that will be helpful for the future generations. <laughs> so, so you want to, you wanna, um, if you come into this world carrying medicine, carrying a gift um, from the realm of your ancestors, then you definitely want to leave it in the ground before you go back so that somebody else can dig it up and, and, and uh, you know, or grow something out of the compost from where you left it. You don't want to come here with it and then get caught up in the dramas and turmoils of, of this middle world and then end up going back there uh, still carrying the, the gift <laughs> that you meant to leave here. <laughs> mm, I so love that what you said about finding the question at the crossroads of soil and soul. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes like, like to me, it's just, it, it's so obvious, but it's also such a like, why didn't I think about it before? Because I don't know, if, if we find a question that will guide our life, but that is not connected to soil or not connected to, so, to um, soul, Mm -hmm. then the other half is is missing and so really the place where the questions live mm -hmm. and the question is like the which will also maybe enable us to to cope i don't know if it's the right word with with the mess the, the climatic mess and all the things that are happening now are necessarily questions that are living there like at the intersection at the crossroads Right, they're, they're, they're only questions that can be found there. And um, it, it's, uh, to, to again, borrow a phrase from Joanna Macy, um, the, it, it is on the knife, the knife's edge of uncertainty that we have the most creative potential. Um, and we're there. <laughs> we're on that knife of uncertainty and, and so it, it, it's a way of sparking um, the right questions and the right and the creativity um, to move forward because there, um, there are incredible beautiful things happening and with shifting consciousness and um, bringing in new paradigms of thought and, and understanding um, where that third thing that we couldn't think of becomes possible. Um, you know, for, for those that are attuned astrologically that speak of an Aquarian age, um, where you enter the time where it 
it has to be revolutionary, it has to be new, it has to be, um, it has to be the thing we haven't thought of, you know. Um, and how you arrive at that, that third thing is you enter the crossroads of uncertainty. Like the quest, you go up onto the mountain and with your palms empty and your heart open, and you, you know, if the only prayer you can say is help, <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> Um, what now? Um, and it, it's in that space that, uh, and people have a difficulty with that space. We always kind of want to move across it quickly. Um, even the word threshold we think of is like the space in a door where you step across. It's about that wide. Um, and yet it's in the threshold space where we're no longer certain about the old story and the old story is falling away. We don't yet have the new story. The, uh, we're, we're in this empty place, um, and that's the place where spirit comes in. If we can make an, allow enough room in there, uh, then grace, then spirit can enter the realm uh, or into our, our awareness um, if we don't fill it too quickly. Um, the tendency to fill uh, fill it too quickly is often with a um, a bright and shinier version of the old story, which looks different, but it's not really different. <laughs> um, and so the willingness to sit in the sometimes discomfort of that emptiness, and and uh, and I'll use the word prayer, um, uh, uh, invocation to something outside of my own resourcefulness, my own uh, thinking, um, something, uh, something outside of me that can, can come in and show something and offer something. Um, and so that's, the, that's the, the crossroads as I think about it. Uh, that place on the medicine wheel, is, we say between north and east, is an is a arc on the medicine wheel between that place where we surrender and let go and in the east with sunrise and new vision, it's like, well, before that new vision comes, there is this place between once having let go and once before this shows up of what's in there. And, and that's, uh, that's the place where the sacred has the best chance of, of us getting out of the way so it can show up. Um, so this thing we call eco-spirituality, that, that's the crossroads. Um, is that every great journey begins uh, with darkness and, and with the statement, I don't know. And you say, well, that's good because when you don't know, now everything is possible. Um, so let's hold that place uh, intentionally and let something, let a third thing come in. Um, and, and yet, as I say, holding that space around the I don't know is also where the healing happens because all the stuff that, that is un, untended uh, begins to, to rise to the surface first. Um, and our old attempts of trying to quiet all down and distract ourselves uh, is part of the reason we've become separate from the conversation um, at that crossroads. So those are some of the things I think about with that, that imagery of the crossroads and the place of soil and soul coming together and how to, how to navigate it um, and how to sit in the unknown. Um, mm. Yeah, and the tension of not knowing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, the, the thing is with not knowing, as I say that, um, we have this thing that, that us humans have created called boredom, which is which comes out of this this uh, um, addiction to immediate gratification. And um, and I say boredom is simply the illusion that there's nothing going on. Mm. Um, and so when we can quiet our minds still enough to pay attention to what is happening, then we've entered the crossroads. Um, so boredom is certain. Uh, I tell my, my students, boredom is something you want to lean into, not distract yourself from or avoid. Lean into it. There may, there may be some gatekeepers there uh, called grief 
or fear or things that as you lean into it start to rise up that would rather have you distract yourself or, or get busy. Um, but once you walk through that, that, that gatekeeper that we call boredom, on the other side of many times deep emotion and awareness, there is this clarity of consciousness that arrives uh, that we have made ourselves available for, that can find us in those moments. Um, and I think of that, that's the crossroads. Um, but it's, it's not a yeah it's 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 not for the faint of heart hanging out at the crossroads <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh the time is flying by <laughs> so would you like to share a poem that would well, like bring anyone, together anyone in particular <laughs> speak speak out or um no one that that you feel like summarizes what we what we were speaking about in a like the invocation is you know one experience and a poem read by you is another experience that brings through something that is not on the level of ration of, of mind but more like mm. So here's one. Um, this is called "Where Where Spirit Meets the Bone." Mm. Similar concept to the to the soil and soul. Where spirit meets the bone. There is a place in your heart, like that in the heart of a lion, hunting, stalking, scanning over open field, water, and rock. That what you are searching for, is also searching for you. Years pass and the passion and the single focus determination hold you to the hunt. Other years pass and lost in your despair and surrender, the hunt will simply not let you go. This destination for the lion and yourself is not marked by arrivals or acquisitions. It is the place where spirit meets the bone a place of action, beauty, and love, unshadowed by thought. Easing forward, held by grace, and guided by faith to touch the unknown, where you can only hear the undecipherable whispers of the unknowable. There is a place in the heart of a lion, as there is in your own heart. That's where spirit meets the bone. Mm. So it, it, it speaks to um, the question that carries us and, and the one we carry. And, and the often um, challenges when I think of my own life, that the times when I thought, this is hard. This is like, this is, if, if ancestors, if you're going to be help, it's time to get down here and do something because I'm doing everything I can. And, and there's and then the frustration is like I'm just tired. I don't know I don't want to do this anymore and it's it's like in those moments that all of a sudden latches hold uh, of me and won't let me go <laughs> so it's quite of a, an elusive dance at times every now and then we come together it's like oh good so we're all flowing well um, but there are times you carry the question um, and there are times the question carries you um, and to always recognize that we're while we're searching to touch the unknown, um, there is that which is always remains unknowable. Um, that that is moving around here, um, and so that's the that's the conversation I see between eco and, and spirituality is is that crossroads where that conversation can happen. Mm, thank you so much. You're oh. welcome. You're welcome. Wealth of wisdom. <laughs> I will need to listen to this interview again. <laughs> well, the um, the ancestors that might have done good. I think they gave me some some adequate things to say. So, um, <laughs> well, grateful for the ones we called in to enter the conversation. Um, left to my own devices, I would tell the same old jokes I've been telling my kids for years. <laughs> <laughs> So for the people who want to 
find out more about you and uh, like know more about you oh, yeah, so, Man, um, where's the crossroads <laughs> one of those crossroads where you and i might meet is um if you go to the uh i guess it'll be listed in the information um the rites of passage council.org website that lists all the the programs i have a separate um a website just by my name caterbrown.com um, that has more information about uh, cowrie shell divination more of my personal offerings um, there's also um, a rites of passage council youtube page which probably has over 60 different videos interviews and discussions with myself and some of my staff on various topics like this that can, could be inspiring for people to plug into um, and then the, the giveaway. So if you go uh, and sign up, um, if you click the link where the, the giveaway is mentioned in this, in this thing, it'll take you to a place where you could sign up to receive our um, newsletter about all the offerings. And, um, and you will get a, a free download of a, a drumming story called Singing Stone mm -hmm. um, that I offer there. And it's a story of the initiatory journey to remember uh, the medicine one carries. And, um, and then other than that, in terms of, I know this is airing later in the year, I think uh, we, have a, um, we have a vision quest coming up in Spain um, late next March of 2023. Um, and of course the, the website will have all the other stuff. So if somebody listens to this, this uh, recording at a different time, I'll just go to the website and see what's current as far as offerings and uh maybe you and i'll meet down the roads at one of those crossroads and sit by a fire and uh, trade some more stories yes i wish. <laughs> I'm, I'm planning to <laughs> <laughs> mm. so the tradition in this summit is that the speakers have the last word have the last word yes mm. oh let's see last word um Pay attention. Mm. The three most important things. Pay attention. Mm. I'll leave you with that mystery. <laughs> mm, thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks for having me.